So now let's look at the different ways of solving them. Okay. So these are what we will call techniques. Okay. So now uh, there are looking at the equations of Maxwell, you could solve them in let's say either the time domain or if you use Fourier ideas, you could solve them in the frequency domain. Okay. So we will see what these are as we as we go along. So um, the um, other way of solving them is by looking at what form in which Maxwell's equations are written. The form which I showed you at the start of the lecture was which form? Differential form, right? They were partial differential equations. Okay. So I can solve them directly in partial in that uh, uh, differential form. There is another version of Maxwell's equations which is in integral form. Right? So, we can convert it to integral form and solve it that way as well. Right? So, now which method to use when? This is really very important and hopefully at the end of this course you will know which method to apply when. If you do not know that, then life becomes like that person who has a hammer. You know, if you have a hammer, everything you see looks like a nail. Right? So, you learn one technique and you have not studied other techniques, so you apply it everywhere. We do not want to do that. So, I will give you a simple example. Uh, Let us say I have a radar. Okay. Now, typically radars, they send a single frequency wave. Right? It is sending a single frequency, let us say an air traffic control radar. It is sending a wave, it is hitting the plane and coming back and we are calculating, let us say, time lag or something to find out how far it is. But it is sending a single frequency. If it is sending a single frequency, then if I substitute, you know, uh, the time dependence of this form, then d by dt becomes j omega. Then all my equations have only spatial derivatives the time derivatives have gone. Since the time derivatives have gone, my pro life has become easier. I do not have to worry about time derivatives. It just become a constant number j omega. So, I have to deal only with the space derivatives. So, in that case, so single frequency case, it is better for me to work with a, a frequency domain way of solving these problems. Okay? Why make life more complicated? On the other hand, let us say you have a situation where there is some transient response that you are interested in. Then you turn some switch on, there is some transient thing that happens over there. There, what happens when I have a very short lived signal in time? What is the frequency content? Very large, it is spread out in frequency. So, if I wanted to solve this problem in frequency domain, I will have to solve for various various omegas, then take the inverse Fourier transform and get the time response. So, that is like holding your nose this way. So, time domain methods would be better for that. Let us say a circuit simulation, you turn a signal on and you want to see how the wave spreads and things like that. Right? So, there we will work directly in the time domain. Okay? So, this is for, for example, transient responses. <coughs> okay. Now, um, so that is two different ways of uh, looking at time versus frequency. The other aspect is differential versus integral. Now, this may not seem very clear to you in this class, but it will become clear as we go along. Um, but there, is, there are a few hints that I can give you. So, when we look at, let us say, the differential form, there is, uh, let us say, for example, d by dt is everywhere and d by dx is everywhere. Okay. So, if you were to solve this numerically, what would you do intuitively? If there is a derivative in time and you want to solve it numerically, you would? No. Well, because I am solving it on the computer, I cannot you calculate these derivatives analytically. So, I will represent a derivative in time by something like f of t plus delta t minus f of t divided by delta t. Finite differences. That is how I will implement a derivative similarly for the spatial derivative. So, when I do this chopping up of space and time into discrete things, um, what happens is that as a wave travels on a discrete grid, it begins to disperse. You want the wave, so physically I send a wave from here to the end of this room, it goes like a wave. But when I want to solve it numerically, I have to discretize chop up space and time into finite segments. I cannot make it infinitely small, otherwise the memory requirement will go to infinity. So, I take some finite distance and when I propagate this field, you will see, we will see in this course that that field begins to mathematically disperse. 
physically it's going in one direction but mathematically because of this discretization it begins to disperse which we don't want so that would be an example where a differential method is not suitable on the other hand integral methods have a very beautiful theory within them which we will study which don't allow the wave to disperse so if i have propagation over long distances over there i sh i should switch to integral equation methods now those of you who saw the review lecture on um, vector calculus there were two very important theorems for example the divergence theorem and stokes theorem right so let's just write down divergence theorem so divergence theorem said that the flux of a vector field is equal to the divergence of i mean the volume integral of this right so closed surface this now when i use integral equation methods let's look at this over here and let's say i have some volume v over here okay so some volume v now if i want to solve the system of uh, the system of equations numerically as i said we must do this chopping up into small dx dy dz dt so on the right hand side i have to chop up this entire volume into small small cubes right that's what will happen so this is a 3d problem but the same thing on the left hand side over here is only over the outer surface so this is a 2d problem over here okay so from a computational point of view the advantage is that in an integral equation method what i can use theorems like this to convert a volume integral into a surface integral and you can imagine that for a given volume the number of small small volume elements will become much larger than just the elements that are on the surface right surface area versus volume which one grows surface remains smaller than volume right so okay let's look at what is the volume of a um, uh, let's say take a sphere what is the volume of a sphere proportional to r proportional to r cube what is the surface area proportional to square right so as r increases as i go to a larger and larger object which number is becoming larger volume is growing larger so this the cost of doing this is going to become more and more because now little little uh, cubes that make up that volume are increasing at a much higher rate than the surface area right so these kinds of tricks they help us to save a lot of computational time right at the end of the day you may have a very good method but you want a solution that comes to you within reasonable time no? you don't want to say okay i have coded it i've i'll come back after one month and usually what happens after one month is you discover there was a coding mistake so uh that's not what we want so that's why you will use these integral equation methods okay so we'll talk about all four different kinds of methods in this course and after you are familiar with all four then you can choose for a given problem what is the best candidate okay uh so these are broadly the three methods that we'll cover in this course okay so what is iem it's <coughs> integral equation methods okay so this is so integral equation methods uh obviously you can say that they are integral methods and usually uh formulated in the frequency domain okay then you come to fem fem is finite element so this is finite element okay uh any guesses is it time or frequency those of you who are familiar with it it's actually frequency domain again so it's frequency domain and is it differential or integral at least the ts should be able to answer differential right so it's in the differential form and finally we have fdtd so that's finite difference time domain okay basically using this idea finite differences right so this as the word almost gives it away this is going to be in time domain and differential form okay so depending on whatever is the problem at hand we are going to use one or the other okay 
So uh, that sort of brings us to where is computational electromagnetics actually used, where would, you know, where is it useful. So I have just put a few simple uh, equations of uh, pictures over here to show you uh, simulation results. Uh, the credits page has gone from here. These are taken from commercial software like uh, um, CST, microwave and uh, HFSS. So for example, the first thing over here. This is, uh, can anyone tell me what is this? This structure over here. It is a horn antenna, right? And what is coming out of this is how is the electromagnetic field that is shooting out of a horn antenna? What does it look like? Okay, so now this is a simulation which was done to find out what the field looks like. Okay, so now horn antenna is known, but now let's say tomorrow for your particular application you build some other antenna and you want to know how does the field look like. Now you will be interested in how the field looks like because let's say you know you have a communication problem i want to communicate from here to let's say that point and i want to make sure that no field goes to some uh, eavesdropper on one side so i have to make sure that this like this big beam over here is only in one direction not in the other direction so how will you know it you have to solve maxwell's equations numerically and get this okay so that's an example of an antenna pattern then here is another interesting example which in technology these days is becoming very important so this is a collection of many many antennas so it's called an antenna array okay so any of you who are in working or interested in 5g these uh, we people will be using antenna arrays instead of just a single antenna there will be an array of antennas which will be used to do beam forming uh, mimo and all of these things so how do you again same problem i want to you know send a beam here but not there all of those things so calculate the radiation pattern of an antenna array so you would use CEM techniques. Uh, the other thing for example we hear about a lot is um, cell phone radiation damage to let us say biological tissue. Is it true? Is it not true? Well, it is not fully clear but at least one way to scientifically study it is to build a let us say a model of human tissue and then simulate a mobile phone radiation and then you can see what is the maximum field generated. Can so scientifically you can say look so much field is generated if it is used for so much time so much heat will be generated there may or may not be tissue damage. So that is one scientific way of doing it. So this is a very active area of research lot of cell phone companies that is why employ computational EM people because before they put a product in the market they have to certify this produces so much radiation things like that. And then there are uh, large amount of military applications. So when computational EM started in the 60s, one of the major driving forces were military applications that you want to make a stealth aircraft. It should not be detectable by radar. Now if you no, know, okay, that is the goal, but how do I make sure that it is not detectable? I simulate and show that the radar cross section is less or more. So in this simple example, what they have done is they have taken an aircraft and either made it out of carbon fiber or a metallic frame. And this simulation is showing you the, you know, the I think the electric fields on the surface. So they are different, and therefore the radar cross section is going to be different. So this can be used for aircrafts, ships, any other such play, missiles where it is needed to know what is the radar cross section. This is RCS calculations. Okay, these are just some of the applications, and um, we'll look at. Uh, more towards the end of the course when we look at applications of CEM.